Welcome all. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Gwen Bird, Dean of Libraries at Simon Fraser University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to a wonderful evening to celebrate our newest nonfiction writer in residence, Shalene Knight. I'd like to get us started by inviting Elder Marie Hooper of the Coquitlam First Nation to offer an opening welcome. Elder Marie. I raise my hands up to creator ancestors, past and present, and to all of you that are here today. I'm honored to be here. My name is Marie Hooper, elder, knowledge keeper, storyteller, ambassador for my nation, Quiquitlam. I am an indigenous, trained guardian of the lands, trained in archaeology, in artifact recovery for Quiquitlam. I am also in residence at the Indigenous Student Center, the ISC, at Burnaby SFU campus. I welcome you. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the Coast Salish peoples whose unceded ancestral ter traditional territories, homelands of the Coquitlam First Nation, where I am live here on Zoom with you all. I'd like to start this event off in a good way. We come together in celebration, a virtual roundtable opening of Charlene Knight's term at SFU Library, nonfiction writer in residence with former writers Angela and Eternity, past and present write writers, and the sharing, the sharing of their personal thoughts into the art of writing, the joys of living, their creative lives to the fullest. How can we how can we um how can we choose a non-fictional book? Um so I, I looked this up, I found it very interesting. Seven essential factors to ensure a rewarding and enriching reading experience. Read reviews and recommendations. Use online reading platforms. Consider your skill level. Identify your interests. Set clear goals. Author interviews and talks. I'm looking forward into hearing from the three authors online uh, today, the love of writing, and I also have the love of writing and have to learn how to um, uh, put together a book about uh, past and present here at Quiquitlam. Um, so I'm very, very interested in being here tonight. Charlotte, Charlotte, Shailene will be delivering workshops for SFU community on non-fictional writing for the public offering opportunities for feedback on writing projects. Showcase the power of nonfiction writing. Shailene is a writer, editor, teacher, and writing coach. And I am very pleased personally to have um, you, Shailene, uh, join, join us up, up at SFU there, and I would love to meet you in person. I'd like to say a blessing at this time. Creator, Mother Earth, we gather here on Zoom coming together in a respectful way. May we work together, network together on life's journey, share stories. Mother Earth gives us all we need to sustain life. We are thankful, humble, and kind. Honor all Indigenous people. Honor all peoples here in Canada and around the world. Always start a new day with a smile, with good intentions moving forward. First Nations people say not samot, meaning one heart, one mind. Haichka, thank you. Haichka, Elder Marie, thank you so much for starting us off and offering that welcome and blessing. It's wonderful to have you here with us and to hear of your particular interest in this event as well. 
It's my privilege to welcome you all to this event to celebrate Shalene Knight, who's joining us as SFU Libraries 2024 Nonfiction Writer in Residence. Uh, Shalene is, I'm just going to check. I see in the chat someone saying I can't hear anything. Is that the case for everyone? Are there people who can hear? I guess that's a better question. People. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Great. Um, thank you. Shalene will be joined tonight by two other extraordinary writers for what will be a casual and candid chat about the art of writing and the joy of living creative lives. And as we begin, I would like to thank our amazing event partner, SFU Public Square, for making this evening possible with us. I have a few Zoom housekeeping notes to share. First of all, note that the event is being recorded and the recording will be posted to the SFU Library and SFU Public Square websites after the event. Tonight's event will take place until approximately 6.45 p.m. And toward the end of the event, there will be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions of our speakers. Please use the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions and our speakers will get to as many of these as they can. If you're having issues hearing our speakers, you may not hear this message, but if you have, require any kind of assistance for audio, closed captioning, or other technological issues, feel free to message hosts and panelists, and one of our technical people will help you out. We do have community guidelines to guide our event this evening, and you'll see them shared in the chat now. Before I introduce our speakers, I just want to say a few words about our nonfiction writer in residence program. Marie, Elder Marie got us started with this, thank you. SFU Library established this program to celebrate and emphasize the power of nonfiction writing and storytelling among the university community. Over the past few years, the incredible writers who have held this residency have developed and strengthened the SFU community's ability to share their experiences, knowledge and research beyond the university and traditional academic publishing to reach public audiences. That's what this writer in residency is all about. As the incoming nonfiction writer in residence, Shalene Knight will be facilitating a series of engaging workshops for the SFU community over the next semester on topics such as how to plan large scale nonfiction projects, writing immersive personal narrative and using lived experience as expertise. She's also offering one-on-one -on -one manuscript coffee chats where you can speak with her about your nonfiction project or writing idea. What an amazing opportunity. Please follow the link in the chat to see how to sign up for these exciting activities. You may already know Shalene Knight as the author of several award-winning books, including the memoir, Dear Current Occupant and the historical novel, Junie, both of which are winners of the Vancouver Book Award in 20. 18 and 2023 respectively. Her newest book came out earlier this month, a book of narrative nonfiction titled Let It Go, Free Yourself from Old Beliefs and Find a New Path to Joy. She also brings to the residency past experience as a poetry professor, a literary agent, a managing editor for Room Magazine and a festival director for the Growing Room Festival. In addition to all this experience in the literary and publishing industries, Shalene is the founder of the literary studio Breathing Space Creative, where she coordinates the Forever Writers Club, a membership for writers focused on creative sustainability and the Thrive Coaching Program. Joining Shalene tonight are two other extraordinary writers that have been our nonfiction writers in residence over the past two years, Angela Starrett and Eternity Martis. I'll briefly introduce them to you and then turn things over to the three of them. Last year's nonfiction writer in residence, Angela Starrett, is an award winning investigative journalist and best selling author from the Wilp Wegak of the Gitten Max community in the Gitsan Nation on her father's side and from Belle Island, Newfoundland on her maternal side. Angela has worked as a television, radio, and digital journalist for more than a decade, including hosting the CBC original podcast, Land Back. It's fabulous. If you haven't listened to it, I encourage you to do so. Angela's best-selling book, Unbroken, My Fight for Survival, Hope, and Justice for Indigenous Women and Girls, was published in 2023. And Eternity Martis was our 
2022 nonfiction writer in residence. Eternity is a multi award winning journalist, editor, and an assistant professor of journalism at Toronto Metropolitan University, whose writing on race and gender has appeared in over 30 publications. She was a senior editor at Extra Magazine for many years and has influenced media style guides around Canada to capitalize Black and Indigenous, including Extra and the Toronto Star. Her award-winning best-selling memoir is called They Said This Would Be Fun, Race, Campus Life, and Growing Up. Please join me in welcoming Shalene, Angela, and Eternity. Wonderful. Here we are. Mm -hmm. Awesome. How's my audio? Is my audio okay? <laughs> now that we had that little tech glitch, I wanted to make sure. Well, thank you, everyone for joining us. I'm so excited. Uh, you know, when I was presented with this opportunity to be the uh, nonfiction writer in residence, I was so, so, so excited. And what a gift it is to hold this space with both of you, Eternity and Angela, and to have an opportunity to discuss joy. Like I've been buzzing all day just thinking about how nice this is going to be because, um, you know, and I've prepared a little, a little intro as writers from racialized backgrounds, we often find ourselves tasked with the profound responsibility of crafting stories that reflect our personal traumas and all while feeling the pressure to represent our communities. And while this work is undeniably crucial, it sometimes leaves us with limited space and energy to embrace joy in its various forms. To set aside dedicated moments solely for our own joy feels both revolutionary and nourishing. So over the past couple of years, I've dedicated my own writing to uh, exploring this idea of joy and what it looks like for me. And my recent book, which still feels weird to say this thing is out in the world, uh, was launched earlier this month, and it has immersed me in a journey of self-discovery. And I've looked back at old patterns, which have, you know, led me to insights about who I am as a person, who I am becoming. And today I am genuinely delighted to be here with both of you, uh, two writers whom I have long admired. So thank you both for being here. And uh, let's get into some some joy. So I have some questions for both of you, but I feel like the word joy has become homogenized to the point where it feels like it's too general for us to claim as is. So maybe we should start things off by each of us sharing our own definition of joy and maybe why joy feels so necessary right now in this moment in the world. So maybe Angela, I'll start with you. What is your, what does joy look like and feel like for you? Yeah. I mean, first off, I just want to congratulate you, Shailene, on mm -hmm. the, the fellowship, but as well as releasing your latest baby <laughs> into the world. Um, it's yeah. such a big thing to do to publish and release a book. And also if people listening don't know, um, The Breathing Room is such an incredible project. My publisher um introduced me to that and I worked with Shailene as a coach and it was such a joy to realize that this was a thing that I could actually um think about what this journey meant to me in terms of like he he a healing process um but on the note of joy um so my next book is on men. And so I've been listening to a lot of podcasts on men, which has been actually really interesting. But one of the men, I can't remember his last name now, but the, the podcast is called Man Enough. And the guy's name is Jamie. Um, and he runs the Wayfarer um, project. Anyway, so he gave this quote, which I thought was so fundamental to understanding what joy is. And it goes, in this world, we are influenced by two sentiments, joy and pain. Joy gives us wings. In times of joy, our strength is more vital, our intellect keener, and our understanding less clouded. We seem better able to cope with the world and to find our sphere of usefulness. 
But when sadness visits us, we become weak and our intellect, our strength leaves us, our comprehension is dim and our intellect veiled. The actualities of life seem to elude our grasp. The eyes of our spirit fail to discover the sacred mysteries and we become even as dead beings. This was so critical for me to think about in the last few me few months because as many people know, I quit my job at CBC. I was there for many, many years, um, not only enduring the daily grind of news, which is never good, news is always bad, um, navigating incredibly traumatic stories, performing often on multiple platforms daily, um, and at the same time, not only you know, um, doing the invisible or maybe visible labor of educating your colleagues about Indigenous issues that are so um, um, well known in, in my community, like the 60 Scoop, residential school, foster care system, everything um, at, from a 101 perspective. Not only that, but having to fight for your place just to belong at a table, at a pitch meeting, in the newsroom, um, having to constantly fend off comments that are incredibly racist. You know, the term microaggressions is important, but I think it's important just to recognize that, you know, as Indigenous Black and people of color, we also experience just flat out racism in 2023. That is shocking on the system. And so when I read this poem, I just thought, what I've been going through the last few months is really recognizing how rocked my nervous system was to the point where I couldn't see through the clouds. I was just doing my job and fighting for my place and wearing this massive coat of armor and never really understanding what joy was. <laughs> mm. And I spoke to this group of Indigenous youth yesterday at... Um, NEC. And I kind of was, I'm just so used to speaking about how traumatic my experience in media was, because I think it's important. Um, and then someone had asked me a question, well, what would your advice be for young people? Or like, what gives you hope? And I just got this big smile across my face. And I just said, you seeing Indigenous people thrive right now on the covers of Vogue, doing like things for our community, not for outsiders' eyes, but for our families, for our people, whether it's fashion, whether it's sport, whether it's um, books, you know, whatever it is, but doing things for us um, that we can love and enjoy and embrace and uplift. And just seeing, you know, people my son's age, like 12 to 25, just living their best lives and feeling loved, you know, by each other and not even caring, like not um, somebody said, well, what happens when the pink cloud is taken away? And I said, we, we don't, we don't care anymore. We don't care. Like we're not dependent on colonial society to uplift us. We don't mm -hmm. need your structures or apparatuses. And I think that's been giving me so much joy is just, I'm just being right now. I'm, yes. I'm, it's taken a while to untangle all of that trauma but um, just to be able to feel the magic of life without constantly having to fight for our basic human rights in institutions, sadly, that is joy right now <laughs> for me. Mm -hmm. um, but so much more, so much more that, that we'll talk about yes. more tonight, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Angela, and, and for sharing that poem as well. I wrote down find our sphere of influence, because I think that's really what it comes down to as well, just figuring out where you fit and how can you do exactly what you just said? Like, how can you be that light, but in the right spaces? So, oh, so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that and eternity. <laughs> what about you? What does joy feel and look like for you? Well, after hearing what Angela had said about finding joy, it was pretty inspiring to me because full transparency I can't remember what joy felt like I, mm. I'm in that cycle of just being so busy and 
having so many things and in the, you know, the constant state of having to defend, right, who I am. And now I'm an assistant professor at TMU, having to defend who my students are and teach them about the journalism industry. And um, it kind of breaks my heart that I have to say that to them because they come in and they're already concerned about racism and massage noir, sexism, et cetera. Um, and so in preparation for this conversation, I was so excited to hear from both of you because it just kind of, I just realized in that moment that like, I don't really know what joy feels like anymore. Mm -hmm. And I really need to get back to that. Um, and I just want to be transparent because I think a lot of us are just kind of in that spin cycle of kind of forgetting the little things. And um, I can't quite remember the last time, you know, I sipped my coffee in the morning and didn't take it to go and ran out the door or had some time to stretch um, or, I don't know, just ate without kind of eating all my food and swallowing it and going off to do something. And so to me, I think what joy was and the joy that I need to get back to for me right now is going to be those little things. So waking mm -hmm. up a little bit earlier, not to do work, but to stretch or to meditate even for five minutes. Um, eating unbothered at my desk or at the table the table I haven't eaten at the table in so long <laughs> um just those little things uh because that's what energizes me and I think it's really easy to get caught up in the like things are happening to me things are happening and I can't stop them uh or I'm busy I'm busy and I, in that you neglect yourself and so that's kind of where I'm at not trying to set these big goals of I need to take a an hour walk but let's start at five minutes let's start at 10 and then 15 and being okay with it being okay with the milestones being much smaller than I would like just to get back on the track to joy mm, get back on the track to joy it just sounds so good to me but it's definitely the small things for sure and I think that's where I'm at as well where my joy is and it's always changing I think but this idea of joy for me is just slowing down like in every aspect of life and that's been so difficult for me even in thinking about the way that I speak and the way that I hold space what if I take a longer breath what if we sit here and nobody's saying anything and I used to be so afraid of that and now I'm like well I have five seconds here let me take that let me hold that uh, but it's definitely the small things for me and I I used to believe that I could only celebrate and I can only experience joy if it is this big, huge thing in front of me that is worthy of celebration. And I think that's the thing I'm trying to break down now. It's like, well, what if I can celebrate the fact that I stood up for myself in email and I didn't, you know, change the, the time of my meeting as pressured to what if celebration could be connected to upholding your boundaries? What if joy and celebration could be connected to helping a writer friend or, you know, all these little things that I think we gloss over and we skip over, like let's find ways to bring that back. So it's funny because my next question for both of you was connected to uh, the micro stuff and, and, and not being bothered by, uh, whether or not the smaller things hold uh, value. So maybe I'll skip over that question and jump into writing because writing is work and there are so many phases uh, within this act of writing. But I've been working a lot with writers who are saying that they're not enjoying the writing anymore. And this is like breaking my heart that we have so many creatives out there who feel pressure to create and to write, but they're not enjoying it. And I'm thinking, well, what is this? Hmm. What is this for? Um, so is there is there a phase of writing that either of you enjoy or, or that you bring joy to? Is there a part of writing that just kind of lights you up? I'd love to know. Maybe I'll start with you this time, Eternity. I think the initial stages of just the what if where can I go with this are really exciting. Um, but I think with my first book, I'm, I'm pretty type A, so I like a lot of organization. And so with my memoir, the outlining part got me really, really excited. Um, <laughs> and I would just like outline, I would outline and outline, and I just loved it. And I found that fun for some strange reason. But now that I'm 
writing my second book, which is fiction. And now that it's actually a job, it's almost, it's, it's so different. Like, I, I feel like with your first book, it's your baby, you put everything into it. You know, you've been dreaming about that moment for so long. And with the second book, you're now an author and you're working towards something that's being published. And so for me right now, the, the step that I'm enjoying is writing something, not feeling really confident in it, stepping away for a day or two, going back and being like, did I write that? <laughs> and just like the joy in like the relief in that, like, stop doubting yourself, what you write is, is, it's good. And so for me, the step of kind of going back to revise and realizing that it was much better than I thought it was, because I let all of the doubt get in the way is yeah. the step that's bringing me a lot of joy right now. Ooh, that's fascinating, too, because it almost sounds like it's, it's the space away from the writing that kind of opened up the joy like let me tuck this away mm -hmm. go back to it oh wait a minute this is actually really great like this is fantastic because it's yeah. that that inner critic is always there and I've had people ask me too and they've said well oh you're you're working on like book four or five so that must go away like you never feel like your writing is terrible anymore I'm like it keeps getting worse really <laughs> when you think about it because you know you know that inner critic is going to come, you know, it's going to, it's going to be loud and boisterous, but I think we have the tools as, as writers to quiet that voice and say, you go hang out over there. I'm enjoying, you know, the, the bright light that's coming from my writing. So that's very, very interesting to me. Thank you for that eternity. What about you, Angela? Where's, where's the joy in your writing process? Where does it hang I out? About, it, it's um so funny listening to you, Eternity. And I'm sure, Shailene, you remember me talking about this. Like, organization is like my, like, I will never get there. And that's okay. <laughs> that is okay. <laughs> so I love listening to you because I'm like, oh, people, people are good at this. Wow. I'm just, I'm just, I'm not. And that's fine. Um. But, um, but I love, but I love that, that, that you have that. Um, I do love routine that does bring me joy. Like people are like, how do you go to the gym every day? And I'm just like, it's not, it's not like I have to do this regimented. It's just like, like every day I get up and have a coffee every day, I go to the gym. Like it's, it's the routine, you know, I'm a creature of habit and I love that. But, um, I, I, I get a lot of joy writing about the land um, and I, I get a lot of joy from being on the land. Like when you're talking, Shailene, about you need something like spectacular, or you used to, to feel that joy. Like for me, the land will always have that spectacular nature, even like walking down a sidewalk in East Van and it's spring and the, the cherry blossoms look like cotton candy. And I guess like for me as an artist, I'm very attuned to my imagination and so the land just, it, it feeds that imagination. And I, I love what I wanted from my book more than anything was for someone to say, you have beautiful writing. Like if, if anyone said that to me, I would have been like, okay, I'm good. Um, I don't need to win an award. I'm good. And just, I think the creative element of writing about the land and my spirituality, which ties deeply in with the land and supernatural beings that brings me joy and comfort because that, that is who I am. And the youth yesterday, I can't remember what they asked, but I was, they were asking me something. And I was like, I was like, know your self-worth, like, no, and not like know your self-worth, but like, know your self-worth. Like there's only one of you in the world and you can be the weirdest person or the wackiest person or the, loser the biggest loser in the school but it's still there's only one of you <laughs> and no one can take that away colonization cannot take um our essence away they can't take our self-worth they can't take our culture they tried um and we have that as um as indigenous people and so for me the the writing and the connection to the land for me that's that's everything and I loved what you said eternity about just one minute or two minutes, just a walk. Cause that's how I think too. Like you need to just, just get outside for even on the porch, just for a heartbeat, just to feel, to feel right. And mm -hmm. to feel whatever you're feeling can be joyful. Getting through the day, getting through the emotion um, is a beauty. It's a gift to be alive. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And yeah, I love that idea of just 
the one or two minutes, like just give yourself that because I think so often we are wrapped up in this idea that we don't have time, but it's like, if you can take one minute, like I think sometimes we think it has to be black or white. Like we need a full five hours to go do this thing. No, just like the one minute outside. Like one thing that I like to do in the morning uh, is like, I'll, I have to walk by my front door to get to my office and the door is right there. 6 a.m. I just open the door. I just take a little peer out. Like, what does the air smell like? Literally 30 seconds. And then I'm like, I did that thing. Now I can go and do, you know, whatever else is on my to-do list. I love that. Trello board full of stuff. You know me, Angela, with the Trello board. I've got all these things there. I know. Um, I'm going to figure it out. I tried. Yeah. Yeah. I love that though. It's that one moment, right? Smelling. Like that's kind of profound because I I just wake up and I go on my phone and it's like the worst thing you can possibly like I know that like everyone is like do not go on your phone because you go from theta or delta to like boom like Mm. it's like so bad for you but I can't figure out how to stop especially the emails the emails I'm trying to stop because you go from calm to anxious real quick so yes I'm trying to move from, okay, you're on your phone, but stop looking at the emails, go read like, I don't know, some 90 day fiance news. And then (laughs) just stop touching the phone. But the emails really get me. It's hard. It's hard. We have to be kind to ourselves though. And it's interesting. I think that's the one area where I feel like I've improved quite a bit. So I haven't had my phone in my room when I go to bed for like a year now. And wow. it's just like, leave That's it on the amazing. coffee table, say good night, bye, like you're saying goodbye to someone you love, and go oh, to bed. But my wow. excuse in my head was that, oh, I need it for the alarm clock. Mm-hmm. Got myself a real alarm clock where I can, you know, look at it so I don't have that excuse anymore. Uh, and it's like a, a little alarm clock that also has meditations and, you know, nature sounds. So I fall asleep to that and I wake up to that. So when I go and reach for the phone, I actually have to do a bunch of stuff before I can even get to it. Like I have to go out my bedroom door. I have to get dressed. I have to go look for my phone. So, but I get it, that that pressure to pick up that device that connects all of us and then that immediate reaction to go to the email. Like it's, it's really difficult. I've removed email from my phone. If anyone out there <laughs> wants to know, I can't, I can't log in from my phone and I don't know what the password is. And I have that to would go make to my me so place. anxious. <laughs> like all this it's stuff, fine. I'm like, that's beautiful. But that would, I would be like in bed, like, I wonder what's going on. Oh, like, yes, it it's a process. For sure. It's a yeah. process. Yeah. I remember when I was working as a literary agent and I was like, all right, got to get on my email, see what's happening. And uh, there was a lot of that anxiety where I felt like, okay, I'm already behind. I'm three hours behind because I'm in, you know, Pacific time zone. Uh, But letting that go took a while and just saying, hey, you know, the emails are going to be there. It's not, it's not the end of the world. Like, let's breathe. Taking care of myself becomes uh, a revolutionary act, really, when I'm able to, to, I guess, combat that anxiety. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think where, where we can find joy and where we can, we can uh, lean on it. So yeah, sometimes joy can be tethered to a part of the brain where we feel belonging and connected to other people. So now my question is, what does it look like for you when you feel like you really fit somewhere? Like you're in a space and you're like, this was built for me. What does that feel like? I'll start with you, Angela. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this um, the other day because so I started doing breath work um, and it's not the modern breath work where you're like hyperventilating. It's like very, Mm -hmm. I guess, old school practice. That's what she says. And she's Cree and she she's singing and drumming and she it's just like she just knows me. Um, And then I have like incredible moments in that and it's like your nervous system is it's so relaxed that it's I don't I can't even explain it it's like you go into another world because it's you're you don't I don't experience that daily mm-hmm. and I thought this is so safe this is such a safe space and I don't 
actually feel that way very often unless I'm on the land. Like the land holds so much safety and belonging. Like I belong here. Like the animals come out and um and I thought about it the other day because I was doing breath work on my own. And I thought about like how how do I create safety for myself? Because I'm not used to that. I'm used to creating this like panicked, got to get it done. Oh my God, like you need to perform and produce. And is this, is this safe for me? Have I created enough safety around me? Which was just a really interesting concept to think about creating our own safety. Um, but I, for me, it's, it's on the land. Um, it's amongst my own people. I did a conference a little while ago and it was all indigenous people. And it was so different than mm -hmm. the book events, which are mostly like I'd say 98% white people, mostly white women, um, very kind, but um, it can be just different. With my own people, I felt it was about empowerment and it was about reciprocity and it was about love. And in the non-Indigenous spaces, mostly the white spaces, it felt like I was on guard and having to explain and perform my trauma almost and or, mm. or reject performing my trauma or having to state my boundaries over and over. And so I think safety for me is, is being amongst my own people or the land um, or um, myself sometimes. Mm. Yeah. It's so interesting because I feel like sometimes there's an opportunity for us to give ourselves that gift, like this idea of safety or emotional safety, just by figuring out what that looks like and feels like for us. Like one thing that I did with this book, this nonfiction book was like, what a nerd. I've got like a little notebook here. And in one of the, on one of the pages, I just wrote down at the top, emotional safety. What is that going to look like? for this particular book? What spaces do I want to be in and what conversations do I want to have? And I noticed like a pattern there too. I want to have conversations about love. I want to be able to be unscripted if it feels like it's a safe space to do so. And it was interesting just writing all of that and saying, well, I actually have quite a bit of control over that. And a lot of that is just, okay, I'm going to say no to the things that I can predict or the spaces that I don't think are going to allow me to show up in that way. Can I say no to this? But I think, again, if it's from this place of intention and it feels like it's grounded and rooted in something, and maybe for you, Angela, it's rooted in the land, maybe even, which would be re really interesting to me, then the saying no to these things, it feels like it's okay. It's like it's something that we can do. So, yeah, it's really interesting, this whole concept of, of safety and um, how that must be so different, too, for all of us such a different, a different uh, experience. And what about you, Eternity? What does it look and feel like when you, you feel like you really fit or have you even experienced that? Yeah, I think, um, Angela, what you said about sometimes safety is yourself. And I think for me, it, it is rooted in myself. Uh, I'm not only extreme, extremely extrovert, uh, introverted, not extroverted, introverted, um, yeah. and need a lot of recharging but mm -hmm. also kind of growing up, never really felt like I fit in anywhere. Part of that is because my mom is South Asian, my dad was, is Jamaican, didn't have mm -hmm. like necessarily a group of friends that looked like me, didn't know where to sit in the cafeteria. Then I became super emo and I was like, there's no black emo girls <laughs> around here. So <laughs> it just got really complicated. Um, <laughs> and um, I don't know, I think when people put labels on you, especially when you're a teenager, they they tend to feel like they stick. And so mm -hmm. you you realize that you're quirky, but then it's uncool to be quirky. And so I spent a lot of my teenage years and even my early 20s trying to find acceptance in being quirky and being me. Um, and so to me, the safety and I find joy and safety in feeling like I can be myself around people. And that's mm -hmm. very hard for me because it took me a long time to kind of get used to people. Like I, I would say it would take me about two plus years to start kind of being myself around people. And mm -hmm. I know that I can be myself when I start singing. Cause I sing a lot of 80s songs 
and I'm comfortable <laughs> doing it. Um, but there's some people that I meet and I'm comfortable being myself within, you know, a month or two. And so to me, it's that I, I feel like the safety of learning your, like to trust your intuition and build your intuition and trust your gut is really important to me. And that's how I find safety in connecting with other people. If I meet someone and instantly I clam up or I don't want to speak, mm. I, I, I trust that, that there's a reason for it. Um, even if, you know, I feel like I've always been right. I don't think I've ever been wrong about it. Um, but instead of just that voice, you know, from your parents or whatnot, you gotta be, you gotta talk to them. You gotta engage. If I feel like it's not working, then I don't force it. Um, Mm. and similarly in the kind of grounded emotionally of just learning how to say no to things. And I know we talk about this all the time, say no, say no, um, but like you, Shaleen, I, I want to show up in places where I want to have the conversations that I want to have that aren't forced on me. Mm-hmm. And one big part of that, of course, is, you know, if you write a book or you're a journalist, you do interviews or you're on, you know, you're on CBC or you're on the radio. And mm-hmm. I think once your work is out there, you have very little control of how people view your work. Um, and I found that to be a huge issue with my first book. Everybody wanted to talk about you know, the book being about racism. And I said, well, my book isn't just about racism. It's about being a woman. It's about growing up. It's about belonging, like finding yourself, finding other people and you lose control of that. And so Mm -hmm. I would, I would not want to go do these interviews, but everyone around you is like, you should do it. It's good to do it. It's good to get the publicity. But at the end of it, I'd feel so drained and retreat back to myself. Um, And so for me, kind of, it all starts with me. And just trying to learn how to trust, you know, who I want to be around, how I want to show up. Uh, If I want to engage or I don't want to engage. If I need to leave or I don't, you know, I don't want to leave. I want to stay a little bit longer. If I want to do the interview or I don't want to do the interview. And so I'm trying to do that a lot more um, because I'm really, I'm really, really tired of not feeling safe because I'm feeling like I have to do things because I should Mm. do them. And I I think... That's exactly what will will totally transform your energy and your joy, because that's something I've been trying to do a lot more recently as well, is just thinking about, because I'm also an introverted human, and I thought there was something wrong with me, and I also thought there, thought there was something weird about taking so long to like let all these pieces of myself out. It's like my partner even said, oh, wow, like it took me years, like to know all these layers of you. And now I see that as a compliment, right? Like, yeah, you really have to be invested to get to know me. So it's like my mindset is is shifting. Um, it's so interesting. I feel so seen right now, eternity, just with everything that you, you shared. Uh, but yeah, just kind of taking back control over how you show up. And, you know, sometimes we can say yes to the things that are a little scary or maybe feel a little bit different if we say yes with the conditions and we say, okay, in order for me to feel safe here, here are the things that I'm going to need. And there's so much power, I think, that comes from knowing what those things are. And sometimes we have no idea. But again, slowing down, thinking about that and then feeling safe enough to ask for those things sometimes. But uh, yeah, you mentioned that you get kind of drained after if you do things that you don't really want to do or if it's like an emotionally taxing thing you get drained what are your recharge activities I'm so nosy mostly because I need to add to my my list (laughs) I I I kind of just sit there and I don't know if that's productive or not but sometimes I just Mm. need to shut off my brain and uh I have a partner who's really great at understanding we're both introverts that we can be together and we can recharge together in the same room without speaking. And mm. I think that's also another sign of stability and security when you can recharge with the person that you're with and you don't have to speak, you know, you feel comfortable to do so. And so I just spend a lot of time just sitting there and being okay with it because I think for a long time I was like, I'm home. Why am I sitting here? I, you know, I feel guilty about sitting here. Go do something, go do this. Mm. And so now I'm like, nope, I'm just going to watch an episode of TV and I might eat something and then I might sit down for a little bit longer because I deserve to. And yes. um, sometimes I I don't need a nap. I just need to sit there and just being, just allowing myself to do nothing, not check my phone, not answer any calls. It's 
really been the way to recharge for me. I just did it actually when I got home today. I'm like, mm. I'm just going to sit here and not talk. And it works. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Such a great gift for yourself. I mean, I had a, a gap in my calendar, which feels rare. And I said, I'm just going to put on a 90s playlist and just just relax and just kind of dance. You know, I could work on my manuscript. There's many, there's lots of stuff to do there, but I just really wanted that time. So it's so great that you're, you know, you know that about yourself because it's, I think it's valuable uh, information. But uh, well, let's talk a little bit about writing because when I look at my own history of what starts a project for me, and it's kind of hard to, to look at and to think about, but I think most of my writing has come from a place of fear. I'm writing things because I'm afraid of them, but I'm also writing to answer questions. And I think something shifted for me with this last book where I said, I am starting the conversation for myself, with myself, about joy and about love. And that's what I want to speak about directly. In all my books, I've kind of hidden the love, tucked it under. I want people to look for it. I don't want to talk about it directly. And now I'm like, no, I'm out there and I'm talking about joy and love. But where does writing start for you? Is it often like something you feel? Is it because there's something really important that you need to address? Where does the writing begin? I'll start with you, Angela. I mean, my first book, it came from, um, I think I used, I don't know if I was like as bad as, or not bad, but like some other people, but I think I was a bit of an oversharer, but I was oversharing in a sort of cryptic, I was one of those cryptic oversharers. So it's mm. like something's going on, but we're not really sure what, um, but it would be like, I was going to Massey college at the time and it was very, um, uh, have, have either of you been to Massey college? It's, it's, it's like, a. No. I think most universities started as Christian or Catholic institutions. So they have all these weird, well, not weird, but different things like this, these different rituals that they do. Mm -hmm. um, so I was processing that and writing about this on these huge Facebook posts. And that's how I sort of um, started writing my, my first book. Um, and I thought it was going to be um, fiction at the time. And I was going to fictionalize my life, which I found much harder there was so much more detail you needed. And I don't know, it just, was it felt more traumatic um I find with the way that my brain works even with my first book um and this may be like the in, I'm also introverted I was also gothic <laughs> I was gonna say yeah. eternity this I was in Lethbridge Alberta which is I don't know if you know anything about Alberta but or Lethbridge but this indigenous um girl woman came up young woman and she was fully goth and I was just like try not to cry and scream mm -hmm. and hug her and I couldn't even be like tell her why I like was so appreciative of her <laughs> reading my book but it was like made my year mm -hmm. um but anyways um so I um I'm an introvert and I kind of have like a how do I explain it? I like love research. I love learning new things. I love being a journalist for the fact that you're learning a completely different view that you never thought of before. Like I, that's just feeds again, my imagination and uh, my curiosity. And I get really excited about like my book now about men, like learning something that I'd never thought of, but is so amazing. And holy shit, like this is going to blow minds. Mm. Blowing mind. Like, I love that. It's like getting excited about a new idea um, that people are talking about. So that's kind of what feeds me. Um, and, um, and being very honest about who I am and mistakes I've made. That sounds weird to be excited about that. But <laughs> because for me, that's change. And we mm -hmm. have um, a, a supernatural trickster in our culture called We Get, and he's constantly effing with shit. But in that process of breaking rules and breaking norms 
and kind of pissing people off, he's creating rivers and oceans and new beings. And so for me, I'm really drawn to that new ideas and, and breaking rules and finding out and being extremely curious. That's sort of what's feeding my, my latest book is sort of deep research mm. into this topic, which is very under-researched in my opinion. Mm. And now we're all like intrigued and we want to know more mm -hmm. about this book. <laughs> I'm just like, I want to read it like yesterday. Really it. Yeah. Because that's the thing. Like, I think that's, that's part of the joy of writing is like that curiosity. You're leaning into something. Because I also like that feeling where I feel like I'm a spy. Like I'm like, I know stuff that no one knows. And I'm like immersed <laughs> in this world. But I'm like, people probably know this, but I feel like I'm the only one who knows it and then breaking these rules so you've got these traditional rules that we are told here's how you write an essay here's how you do this and in my brain I'm like no I need to snap that in half or I need to do it backwards or I need to do it this way and in, in doing that what message am I relaying to the reader what secret message are they receiving because I've intentionally broken this rule or this template and then what overarching conversation am I having because I've I've done that those are the things that really excite me about writing. And sometimes I forget that. So I feel like, oh, I had to write that down just in case I forget it again. So thank you for that. And so that's so cool. Decolonizing writing too, right? Like I know yeah. this Nishka guy who did, his, who did his entire PhD thesis with no punctuation. Mm. And his advisors lost their minds. They were like, absolutely okay. not. And not take you know he was like sorry but this is what's happening <laughs> I don't need your approval I'm doing this and same with my book everyone was like mm, I've never heard of a book that's um investigative journalism and memoir or like you need to pick one and I was like I don't think I'm going to and my agent was like I think I think you can I think that you can do this and so I I love that like decolonizing mm -hmm. the writing process People always ask me, how do we know when this is decolonized? Well, it's when we're not speaking English, right? Mm. So that's mm. the gauge for me. So when we're putting so much, like when people police me on Twitter, like, oh, you spelled that wrong. I'm like, good. Because yes. <laughs> it's English. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Although my book is in English. But um, yeah, trying to break some of those rules. Mm. For better. So important so important and again I think find just finding ways to kind of light that spark uh, in so many of us especially when we get bogged down by deadlines and and what's happening you know in the world I think we still have to remember we have this beautiful craft we have this art that we can shape and mold and just be immersed in but eternity what about you in terms of uh, writing where does it often start for you or where does the joy kind of come in for you too I think for me there is some sort of burning question that kind of like wakes me up and I think about and it nags at me like I need to tell this story and like there's a lot of stories I want to tell and like you Angela I love research I will over research research too I love it um, <laughs> I'm like one plus one equals three you know because I have one piece of information <laughs> So I, I love it too. I think um, for me, it's just something that really, really like won't leave me alone. And so for my first book, um, like had that experience at Western and it was just something we were all talking about. After I published the book, I realized that, you know, so many generations, just 60s, 70s, 80s of students who went to, to Western and other schools in Canada um, had a very similar experience, almost verbatim to what I had described in the book. Um, and so for me, that's what I really held on to because when I started shopping around the book back in 2018, uh, I got a lot of from editors. Well, I don't understand it. We all go to university. We all, you know, we're all messy. And I'm like, this is not what it's about. Mm -hmm. Like, this is about the conversations that I'm having with my friends or our grandparents had that have not been resolved or our siblings or whoever. Um, and so just sticking to that, that I know that there's something here to tell and using my story, not as the story, but as a jumping off point to discuss other things was really important to me uh, because I also mm. had begun my 
writing process with the first book of it just being pure, um, pure fiction. Well, pure, sorry, pure, pure memoir. And the world kind of changed between, you know, 20, but when I started writing it in 2010, then 2012, right? Um, then 2014. And then things just got weirder and weirder. Then we had like the far right and the alt right and Canadian values and all this stuff. And I was like, well, this feeling that was bugging me is now bugging me to make that a bigger part of this story of mine. Um, and so it was really important to me to make sure that I had a an agent and my agent, Stephanie Sinclair, um, was incredible and she believed in it just as much as I did. And she was like, no, we're not taking this to anyone who doesn't understand it. And I'm like, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Uh, you know, no matter how much you want your first book to be published. And um, I think with my second book, what's driving me right now and the joy I'm finding is that after the first book, I think I've completely burnt out talking about race and trauma and gender based mm -hmm. violence. And I don't think I've had to come to terms with kind of this own battle I'm having of, you know, you have to do it or you're not, you know, you're not really doing the work if you don't talk about it. And right now I'm at a place where with my next book, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write something really fun. I'm writing about two, like this two friends backstabbing each other throughout their lives. It's mm. got mean girl vibes. Um, okay. And I'm like, you know what? I just need to do it for me this time. You know, the first book was, it felt like it was for other people, but this one is for me. And mm -hmm. if people don't like that, then, you know, I just, I have to do this for me. It has to be different. And I think right now, people know what I write about and it is about race and gender. And this book does have, you know, a black character. It has racism, but I just want to do something fun and lighthearted. Cause I feel like I'm a, I'm, I should have that. I'm allowed to have it. And yes. one of my dear friends, Manel Matani, I was telling her about my next mm. book when I initially pitched it. Um, and she's like, you know what? You deserve to write something that brings you joy. You deserve to write something that is fun and lighthearted. You deserve that. And it really got me thinking about that, that I could do, I could write stories that were fun and lighthearted because I'm not just confined to writing the hard stuff all the time because it has such an impact on who we like our, our everyday, our functioning. If we get sick, you know? Um, so that's where I'm at with the writing process, just having fun mm -hmm. with it and being okay with that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think so many people, may, possibly even in this room, need to hear that, that we deserve to write stories that feel good for us and to be able to lean into that and not feel like we're compromising or losing out on something if we shift gears. I think it's so valuable to do that. Like I'm a genre hopper. That's, that's the phrase I gave myself. Started in poetry, jumped into weird hybrid memoir, from there into fiction, now narrative nonfiction. And now I, I decided I wanted to write a guided journal. And I, at first I'm like, who, who am I to write this thing? And then I'm like, well, that feels good for me. So um, let me lean into that. So maybe I want to write a children's book. Maybe a cookbook is in the works. Who knows? <laughs> Who's going to say no to these things? Um, we have to just say no to ourselves. But uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Did we lose Angela? Is I she think so. Oh. I don't see her. Hopefully she pops She'll back in. Back. Yeah. Yeah, it might have been an internet uh, connection thing. Oh, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Well, that's okay because I have many questions and hopefully Angela pops back in in time for this one. So I want to talk a little bit uh, about self-growth. When I, when I look back um, to the writer just starting out completely unsure of every single thing connected to writing and publishing, I don't look back with that desire to change anything. But what I love to do is look for patterns uh, connected to my growth. So I'm curious, how do you track how far you've come in terms of like writing and publishing? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. I think I, I track growth in, in the actual words for me, in the writing itself. Um, I think back to what I had said a bit earlier, sometimes you write things and you don't feel confident in them or you have a story and you, you're not sure that you know, the imposter syndrome sets in and you're like, I, you know, did I, did I write this right? Did I do this person justice or the story justice? And I think I track my growth in 
having those questions still, because I think being a good writer and a good journalist, you're always wondering that, but in not, in, in being confident in my skills as a writer. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's growth. Uh, sometimes the answer feels quite intuitive to me or the sentence feels very intuitive. Um, and I trust that now. And so that to me is the growth is that yes, like as a writer, you, you're always struggling because it's never perfect for us. And there mm -hmm. always will be another, a better sentence or someone will say it in a way that, you know, was more eloquent than you, but just trusting the work that I do now and the stories I want to tell and how I approach them for me is the growth um, and feeling confident that I can do the job. Not that the job will be mm -hmm. easy because I think with a lot of our work, I was just telling my students this today, I'm teaching uh, a graduate class on narrative journalism and they're mm -hmm. pitching stories. And I said, you have to commit to a story that you can see through. You don't have to love it all the time because when you get your notes back on draft one, you're going to say, I hate this thing, but you have to like it still and you have to commit and see it through. And so to me now, one of the ways that I see growth is that I don't choose stories anymore for the sake of choosing them. I choose them because I know that it will be hard, but I can do it and I'm committed to seeing it through. Mm, such valuable, valuable tips and advice. I think, I, and I don't think we are taught to track this growth, which is astounding to me. But one thing that I've been able to pinpoint which is really exciting is in, in terms of tracking my own growth is how long I stay immersed in that negative mindset. Like I remember before when I, the first time I ever got tracked changes comments from an editor on my piece and I saw all those comments and I was like, <laughs> what am, how am I supposed to fix this? Oh, I'm terrible. Like I had no idea what was going on. But when I look back to that, like 10 plus years ago, Versus now, where when I get all, and I think I had 759 comments on my last manuscript, and I'm like, all right, there's work to be done. It feels exciting to me. Like that negative voice is there, but it's only there for like 20 minutes. And then I'm like, cool, quiet, and then let me get to work. Whereas 10 years ago, I might have been like wallowing in this, with this inner critic kind of, you know, in my ear for days, weeks, months. So the, the growth for me is watching how that has how that can shrink over time. And Angela, you're back. All right. Awesome. Sorry about that. Oh no, that's cool. rookie move. I didn't have my computer plugged in. Uh -huh. <laughs> back. You're back. We were talking a little bit about how we track our own growth um, in terms of our writing, like where we might have been a year or two or three or five years ago versus now. How do we track how we've grown? And I don't know if you have any mm. any anything that you you use as a benchmark or yeah. I mean I think you touched on something right there about your reactions mm -hmm. and that's really a way that I kind of track my own growth is you know even being in an airport you've missed five flights you have to do a keynote the next day it's now screwed you miss this big meeting and you know I think Five years ago at the depths of my, you know, nervous system being rocked in this wild reporting job, I would have just lost my mind on people, which is so unbecoming of anybody and had a little spaz out internally and just been freaking out. And I was just like, well, this is, you know, somebody called it spiritual. I don't know if I would see it as spiritual, but I was like, well, I've got 11 hours at the airport. That's an opportunity for me to do some things. Obviously, this happened for a reason. I ran into my little cousin who I'd never met before. That was so cool to see this young woman so wise. And I looked at that as an opportunity, you know, and and like you were saying about the track changes. And now you're like, sweet, I got some things to do looking at it as there's some people out there who want to make me better, who want this book to be the best that it can possibly be rather than, oh my God, like, wow, this is, you don't like me and blah, like internalizing all of those things. And it's, it's pretty wild how, um, 
for me, I, I got to that point through tapping. I don't know if people know about tapping, mm-hmm. but I started doing tapping for miracles and money because <laughs> I was very broke at the time, not even very long ago. Um, and it changed my brain chemistry. Yeah. So someone would come at me like, sorry, you've been denied. And before I would have just lost it on them. And then I was like, oh, I'm sorry, you, you must have misunderstood me. I actually meant this. And they were like, oh, we'll have to relook at that. And I like received what I was looking for, which was wow. a pretty significant thing. So it it gets your brain to think in terms of like benefiting you, solutions for you, growth and evolution, instead of this is happening to me, it's this is happening mm-hmm. for you. Like life is, the universe is happening for you to grow, to evolve as hard as it may be in those moments where it's horrific and this is not a good time. Um, it's good to have those moments of reflection to say, wow, I've grown a lot and I've become a wiser, stronger, um, more gentle, um, more softer human being who has compassion for myself and everybody else around me, you know? So for me, that's, um, huge. Yeah. Mm. I think bigger than like the writing process itself. It's massive. That's huge. Thank you for sharing that. Again, I think there's, there's so many things we can do, you know, especially if we think outside the box, how do we call in, how do we call in joy, but how do we do so in a way that makes sense for us as individuals? And one thing I've been doing, and I used to feel so weird saying this, but it's like, I've created a CV for my soul. So instead of tracking, you know, all of these different things that I've done professionally, I've got like a personal one. And when I'm starting to feel like, you know, the negative mindset's coming on, I'm like, let me look at my personal, my 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 that. CV for the soul tracker. And it's it's weird, but I, I feel like it, again, and it reminds you, look at all these things that I've done to invest in myself as a person, not just the writerly stuff, not just the professional development, but me as Shaleen, this is a list of things I'm tracking. And that really makes me feel good because it reminds me that yes, I'm putting myself first. I'm creating the conditions to do all the things that uh, that I love. So I'm aware of the time, friends. We have about, I think, six minutes. So folks in the audience, if you have questions for us, you can definitely throw them in. I see we have one from Natalie. The question is, what art writing, music, film, et cetera, do you find yourself gravitating towards when you need a little bit more joy in your life? Ooh, I don't know if either of you wanna answer this. I feel like, oh, go, go ahead, Eternity. Oh, you have a way better answer than me. Uh, mine is very quick. Uh, <laughs> Sex in the City. It is my hey. go-to wow. for I, <laughs> anytime I'm sad or I need some joy. Sex in the City. I also just re-watch a lot of films. It's my comfort. Um, I don't know if anyone else does this, but yes. sometimes you need to just re-watch it and not watch something new and you need the security of knowing what's going to happen. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Because <laughs> I was telling my partner I was like they were at the ceremony and um me and my friend were trying to sleep and she was in her other hotel room and she was like well, what did you do and I was like well I was trying to sleep so I just put on a murder show and she was like what and I was like well you you always know what's gonna happen <laughs> something bad that happens <laughs> somebody did it and hopefully they get justice like you you know you know the outcome <laughs> you know the formula Mm. um yeah it's kind of I don't know I've really tried to watch comedy or dramas or and I just I can't I've watched every single doc that exists on Netflix like I there's no more left um and Crave (laughs) as well I've had to move to other platforms my podcasts are all I'm I'm so glad I'm not the only one who does this. That's what I go to bed too. <laughs> we can exchange. So I think I have some great podcasts for you. But yes, I have okay. exhausted Me too. Like, true crime Netflix documentaries. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Put together yeah. a list. We can all we can share it. <laughs> because I'm the same way too. I'm always looking for something that is a comfort and not necessarily because of the content, but because of what I know to be true about it. And it's just that that 
familiar feeling I think is is often what I'm after like sometimes I'll have a tv show on in the background I'm not really paying attention to it but it's just there it's like a friend holding space for me so again I think we need more opportunities to talk about things like this because it seems like it's these are the things that contribute to how we show up for ourselves our writing our families our communities uh, what are the unique ways in which joy shows up for us um so yeah that's where i'm 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 at how are you both feeling right now how about we do a little check-in before we hand things over to uh gwen how are you feeling eternity I feel so great. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to be here with both of you. Um, I'm going to go do things. I feel so inspired mm -hmm. by just listening to both of you. Uh, I'm going to go take that walk and yes. spend some time drinking my coffee and mm -hmm. kind of re-engaging myself in the writing process. So, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. This is so nourishing. Wonderful. I'm happy. Nourishing for me as well. What about you, Angela? How are you feeling? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to say one last thing about because yeah. when, when my answer was going to be like, I don't have I have too many things to to do. I don't have anything <laughs> that I do that brings me joy to that I have to consume. But I will say what does bring me joy is like you were saying, Shailene, like you can say no to things. So, you know, I have to do all these blurbs for these books, but mm. they're incredible books. Like I get to read them and they bring me joy and finding joy in that. And, you know, I do have to do all this research for my book, have to do, I want to do. It's like, I get the privilege to review all these incredible podcasts, you know, um, not just the true crime stuff, but finding joy in the things that, um, you have to do like reframing it mm -hmm. you know what I mean so um, I do have I, I go to the gym every single night it's like sometimes I'm just on my phone on a machine for like too long but it's like my it's like I do it every night I love it I love the people there they're all very like young a lot of mm. our um, yeah it's just my my safe space and I get to um experience dopamine and all this stuff so yeah. and they say when you're working out you have the greatest manifesting powers that you have in any time mm -hmm. in your day when you're um when you're working out mm -hmm. I don't know what, what wow. speed it has to be maybe just walking so I do a lot of manifesting when I'm on the treadmill running like I do a lot of processing I do a lot okay. of zoning out too I do a lot of math which is weird, but, um, so I'm going to go do that now. Um, but I, I'm so lucky that I got the chance to connect with both of you and so many similarities and yeah, I'm just, I'm so grateful that you invited both of us. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Well, I'm thrilled that we had this opportunity to hold space and to learn so much about each other and to find these commonalities. Again, so powerful because who knows what space we might show up in together later on. Who knows? I'm excited. But uh, thank you both so much for this. And uh, I'll pass it to you, Gwen. I see you're here. Yeah, thank you all. That was wonderful. And I hope you are able to see the love that's coming through in the mm. in the chat and uh, uh, outpouring of appreciation there. So thank you all for that wonderful conversation. It was so enriching to hear you all share about joy this evening. You talked about slowing down, celebrating victories, small and large, upholding mm. boundaries, taking longer breaths, being in silence, the ways that you can recharge, and then considering together in just a brilliant conversation how your writing practice relates to this, what fitting in and safety mean. You talked about fear and love, growing as writers much more than that. It was just such a treat to hear your thoughts this evening. So thank you all for your honesty and your openness, your generosity, and thank you all for your stint as writer in residence at the SFU Library. I'd like to offer my gratitude again to our event partner, SFU Public Square. It's a real pleasure to work with all of you. And I wanna offer thanks as well to Chloe Riley from SFU Library who planned this event this evening and who does all the behind the scenes work to run our amazing writer in residence program. 
And as a reminder, if you want more, Shaleen will be hosting a series of engaging workshops as well as offering manuscript consultations over the next four months of her residency. So please do sign up if you're interested in those. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank Bye you so everyone. much. Bye. Bye. Have a good evening. See you.